Welcome to the Awesomers.com podcast. If you love to learn, and if you're motivated to expand your mind, and heck, if you desire to break through those traditional paradigms and find your own version of success, you are in the right place. Awesomers around the world are on a journey to improve their lives and the lives of those around them. We believe in paying it forward, and we fundamentally try to live up to the great Zig Ziglar quote, where he said, you can have everything in your life you want if you help enough other people get what they want. It doesn't matter where you came from, it only matters where you're going. My name is Steve Simonson, and I hope you will join me on this awesomer journey. If you're launching a new product manufactured in China, you will need professional, high-resolution, Amazon-ready photographs. Because Simo Global has a team of professionals in China, you will oftentimes receive your listing's photographs before your product even leaves the country. This streamlined process will save you the time, money, and energy needed to concentrate on marketing and other creative content strategies before your item is in stock and ready for sale. Visit simoglobal.com to learn more, because a picture should be worth 1,000 keywords. This is episode five of the awesomers.com podcast. That's episode number five, and you can find all the show notes and relevant details by going to awesomers.com slash five. That's awesomers.com slash five to see all of the relevant show details. Uh, This episode is a little bit different because we do a live question and answer session with entrepreneurs and awesomers from around the world. So from time to time, we will post these uh, live Q&A sessions. They'll be posted at awesomers.com and various places on Facebook. And for those who join us live, they'll get the chance to answer questions, sometimes on video, sometimes on audio, and sometimes just through the live chat function. But uh, between myself, Steve Simonson, and sometimes special guests, we'll try to answer your questions and help you out as best we can. So what a great opportunity for the community to be involved and, and become part of the show. And this is one of those episodes. It's our first one. So, you know, nothing's ever perfect, but uh, we're always trying to improve. So thanks for listening. And again, this is uh, Awesomers podcast number five. Okay, everybody, welcome back to awesomers.com. Uh, today, we are doing a live session, a little Q&A. Uh, you might think of it as talk back or perhaps even back talk, uh, depending on who asks the question. But uh, either way, we want to just talk a little bit about uh, what's happening out there. Uh, one of the things that has, has caused a significant amount of consternation in the Amazon world is this uh, so-called review purge. And the, the change in terms of service at the end of 2016 created a, a whole series of events uh, from Amazon trying to uh, respond basically to some bad PR they got. Uh, I think it was the New York Times or some big publication said, hey, uh, everybody's gaming the system of reviews on Amazon, and it's it's overt, it's naked, it's ridiculous, and uh, why are you letting people get away with it, Amazon, if reviews are supposed to be credible, and if that's supposed to be uh, kind of your, your sense of trust with a customer. Uh, since that time, there's been kind of a ratcheting up of what uh, review enforcement looks like. And uh, the interesting thing is often the reviews, um, the, the same review tactics have worked since 2016. But boy, in the last six months, and particularly in the last six weeks, uh, heading into uh, you know, the middle of 2018, the, the level of sophistication and what they're scanning for seems to be significantly more aggressive. So some examples we've seen, and again, this is happening routinely, including in the, you know, the, the past 24 hours before this recording, uh, people are still having reviews uh, disappearing in wholesale uh, measures. In other words, people having 750 reviews now have 75 reviews. Some people who had thousands of reviews now have you know, uh, dozens or, or maybe even hundreds if they're lucky. And other people have had their reviews wiped out and had their accounts suspended. So you know, a lot of people ask, you know, well, what is Amazon looking for? What's causing this problem? Why do you get people get suspended? And as always, Amazon doesn't give specific answers because the more specificity they give, the more people try to game that those specifics. And so they just kind of say, don't do anything uh, nefarious, don't do anything wrong, and don't do anything to game the system. But their interpretation of that seems to be far and wide, including things as simple as asking for a review in an email. Uh, A poorly poorly worded uh, email to a customer post-sale saying, hey, it'd be nice if you uh, left a review, or if you're happy, leave us a review. 
that can lead to account suspension. And we're talking about, um, uh, it appears that there's a 21 day suspension if they say that you've been gaming uh, the reviews. That's what they consider manipulation of reviews. And 21 days suspended from the account, not the item, but your account shut down for 21 days is one type of uh, seller focused enforcement that's happening. So that's from the seller perspective. What, is, what are the seller behaviors that are happening? And how is the seller going to be held accountable for that? So uh, there's a lot of people now who are taking away the request for feedback or reviews in their email follow-up sequence. Now, whether that's a good idea or a bad idea, I can't tell you. And, and again, it really boils down to the, the words you use. If you ask, especially people who are delineating between, if you're unhappy, email us here or, or contact us here and we'll take care of you. If you're happy, go leave a, a five-star review. That's for sure going to get you in trouble at this stage. You know, it doesn't mean they, they've scanned every account or they're, they're going to actively have you shut down in the next 24 hours, but that kind of parsing of language, you know, if you're happy, go this way. If you're unhappy, go that way. Amazon, not a fan. And they have said uh, unequivocally that that sort of thing will lead to trouble. So from the seller perspective, people really need to review what they're doing. Uh, email follow-up sequences, um, even inserts, anything that might lead to trouble. Now, I don't think Amazon is actually looking at inserts. I don't think that uh, inserts have nearly the visibility of an email. So uh, for most people who use an email follow-up sequence, they are sending out you know, one to four emails. Uh, I think four is too many. Uh, one's probably not enough. Uh, probably two or three is the right answer. And they should be largely service focused and delivering of, of a good experience. So content delivery, you know, here's how you to use our product. Here's uh, common, um, you know, frequently asked questions, these types of things. Those are good service elements to include um, in a feedback sequence. So that has high visibility because it's being delivered on the Amazon platform itself. Whereas uh, inserting a, you know, something into the package, whether it is a physical part of the label that may be on your product itself uh, or an insert, a physical insert that's uh, put inside the box, uh, not inside the shipment, right? If you're doing fulfillment uh, by merchant or seller fulfilled prime, if you're just putting it in with the box, that's against Amazon's terms of service. But if you put it inside the box uh, as it would come from a manufacturer and it's a manufacturer communication, this is still relatively acceptable especially if you're positioning it from the manufacturing perspective versus from the seller perspective. So, so far I've talked about kind of the seller enforcement angle, uh, but I want to uh, change our attention over to the, the consumer angle. So uh, again, recently uh, people have been making noise and, and the media has been publishing articles about the fact that some uh, even consumers are being uh, fired basically from Amazon. They're like, you can't order here anymore. And a lot of people have said, well, it's related to uh, their refunds or rate is too high. And, and uh, there's been some uh, <laughs> interesting cases. One uh, couple, I don't recall they were, where they're from, somewhere in the Midwest, maybe Michigan. Uh, they basically purchased a million dollars worth of stuff, uh, said they were returning it and asked for the credit, got the credit back, never returned it and sold it. And uh, they've now been uh, apprehended, put in jail. So there's, there's all kinds of manipulation that happens on the consumer front uh, from uh, returns, from you know, fake returns. But I think even the review uh, side of the equation is getting attention. Amazon, in the last two years, put in requirements. To leave a review, you have to have at least $50 of purchases on Amazon, uh, whereas before, you just need an Amazon account basically an email and a password got you an Amazon account. And there were many, many companies, these still exist today in, in Bangalore and all around the world that are focused on gaming that system, right? They have tens of thousands of Amazon accounts and they will go leave reviews, they'll make fake purchases, this whole ecosystem exists. So from the seller side, Amazon, or from the buyer side, the consumer side, Amazon's trying to get rid of some of those fake accounts and those bad actors. So that's another area of focus. So there's the seller side, then there's the buyer side. And finally, there's the ASIN side. So people look at that ASIN, Amazon specifically looks at the ASIN and says, you know, what algorithms can we run to analyze the statistical relevance of this product? <clears throat> Excuse me. Getting reviews in a, uh, well, let's call it a normal way. So 
it's very clear when you launch a product, if you make 10 sales and you get 10 reviews, that's a hundred percent review rate. That's probably, uh, well, it's probably manipulated, honestly, uh, from using Amazon's language. Now, all of us know we want to get as many reviews as we can when we launch a product, but Amazon's like, hey, if they're not real, you're not keeping them. They, there's a, a high degree of speculation that Amazon has, has taken your Facebook friends and associated those friends and uh, family for that matter, and will proactively say, hey, you know, we're going to ignore reviews from them and we will delete potentially reviews from them. And further, we may suspend your account if we see a bunch of reviews from them. Now, I haven't seen any firsthand evidence that Amazon is actually using that, although it's been confirmed that Facebook's given them access to uh, certain data points, including your friends list, without your permission, by the way. Uh, there's an article about that just came out recently. Um, but I can, I can tell you whether Facebook cooperates with Amazon or not, whether PayPal cooperates with Amazon or not, there, there's plenty of general consumer data at the consumer credit agencies that know all of your friends, all of your family, where you've lived. They know, you know, if you've ever gone through credit uh, checks or, you know, you're trying to apply for a car and they're like, hey, we want to make sure it's you for uh, uh, identity theft re requirements and so forth. They'll ask you, you know, what house did you live in? What was your old phone number? That's easy enough. But they'll often say, what's your brother? What city does your brother live in? Uh, where's your sister? You know, They'll ask you all kinds of deep questions that you're like, why do they know this stuff about me? So my point is that it's not just Amazon or Facebook cooperating. It's, there's a whole bunch of data out there. So the best method then to deal with all this you know, uh, review mania or the, avoid the review purge is to get reviews the old-fashioned way. You know, What if we actually sold a product that somebody felt compelled to review? Uh, the follow-up sequence was subtle. I think the code still that is generally accepted with it is if you ask for feedback versus a product review, even though Amazon says it's still okay to ask for a product review, if you ask for feedback, you know, your feedback is welcome. We'd love to have your, your feedback about this product without bias, without seeding them towards, you know, a positive thing. That's, that's a, an important piece of the puzzle to, to consider the, the idea that, um, there's such a, a, a nuanced, I don't know, a nuanced issue with nomenclature. It seems idiotic to me, but that, you know, Amazon's Amazon. So the review purge does continue. Um, and, and who can tell where it's going to come from? But the, the reality is there's no way to avoid it. And my, my main advice is just to get reviews the old fashioned way. Sell a good product, have a proper sequence of reviews. There are some some advanced tactics that seem to be uh, still working that I don't want to get into uh, here because Amazon can eventually see this. But I would say that you know any advanced seller can can share some of those advanced tactics with you. I don't think they're in violation because they don't uh, ask for bias and they don't reward or incentivize for reviews. But it's just kind of the method of asking for that review that is evolving to get out of Amazon's radar. Empower. The name says it all. Connecting e-commerce entrepreneurs with great people, ideas, systems, and the services needed to stay business dynamic and to grow. Empowery is a network, a cooperative venture of tools and resources to make you better at what you do. Because we love what you do. We are you. Visit Empowery.com to learn more. Uh, okay, so that's enough on reviews. Um, now, if everybody has questions, you can scroll down to the uh, bottom uh, chat and you can just click into the chat and I can see those things. And, uh, and so don't hesitate to ask questions if you have on this subject or any subject that you wish to discuss. Um, talking about Prime Day is uh, a big deal. Now, I think most people are speculating, uh, myself included, that uh, Prime Day will be July 10th. And that's this coming July 10th, 2018. Uh, Amazon expects it to be its biggest Prime Day ever. And for those who don't know, Prime Day is larger in terms of gross sales volume than Black Friday. So ma Amazon manufactured this holiday in July because July is generally the slowest month. Uh, <laughs> and all of us who've gone through Julys are like, what's happening? Why is everything falling apart? But it's just summertime and, and people aren't online uh, purchasing as much uh, unless you sell summertime stuff, right? If you're selling patios and barbecues and uh, this sort of stuff, uh, you're, you're probably living the dream. But uh, for, the, for everybody else, especially consumer-driven products, uh, 
that are, are fed by Q4, July is not that awesome. So Amazon re realized that said, we'll manufacture this holiday. We're going to call it prime day. And uh, that started uh, basically, I think this will be the third one. I could be wrong, but I think it's the third one. So uh, if you haven't prepared already, some of the things you need to consider uh, ensuring you have inventory, uh, they've already uh, handed out the, the lightning deal slots, but keep your eyes open. Maybe if something uh, opens up, if you can get a lightning deal, they are more expensive and they're less and less effective lightning deals these days. Um, but if you have the stock and you have the potential to make some uh, money, uh, in other words, high throughput on prime day, it's something to consider uh, posting. So prime day is uh, an important one uh, to consider. So we talked about inventory. We talked about the fact that you want to try to get in uh, some lightning deals, but you might even consider some coupons on that day. Uh, and as you guys know, to, to put a coupon in the system usually has a five day, I think it's a five day uh, waiting window. Uh, but so getting those in ahead of prime day would be to your benefit. Uh, and remember these prices, you know, these discounted prices, they help set future lightning deals. So don't get too nuts. Uh, people often forget when you set the bar lower on your price and then you get a lightning deal offer that comes in later, uh, it has to be a, a certain discount level below that prior, I think it's a 90 day price average. And Amazon sometimes moves, moves these uh, targets around. Uh, so I, I could be wrong, but fundamentally, if you don't have your, you know, if you're not beating your, let's say 90 day price by 20%, then they don't want your lightning deal. They don't want your, your deal of the day or whatever uh, opportunities you may have. And that of course leads to additional discounting, right? And additional margin uh, being uh, gobbled up. Uh, one of the problems, and we've talked to Amazon about this. One of the problems is if you get your listing hijacked and then somebody makes a lower price listing, they set that price uh, for the, the ASIN at large. And although we've encouraged them, we, we think they're going towards independent supplier pricing for that ASIN. In other words, if somebody comes in and hijacks it, sells it for a dollar, you shouldn't be obligated to sell it for 80 cents when the, the regular price is $22 or whatever. Um, Amazon says they, they recognize that issue uh, they uh, they haven't, as far as I know, uh, produced a long-term solution for it. Uh, so anyway, uh, pre preparing yourself for Prime Day, I think, is a relevant thing to, to consider. Uh, one of the other topics that uh, has come up, and I got a lot of questions about this in the last uh, 30 days or so, is, you know, with Vendor Express going away, uh, Amazon decided earlier this year, um, in 2018, to, to say, you know what, Vendor Express... Uh, is no longer important to us. And I'll be honest, uh, I'm not sure how great of an idea Vendor Express was to begin with. Uh, the principle of it was, you know, there's Vendor Central, which is a much more sophisticated wholesale method that Amazon buys. And when it says ships and sold by Amazon, that was purchased through Vendor Central for the most part. But a couple years back, uh, maybe even three years back, they developed the Vendor Express as a method to, to an easier method to get people into the system to wholesale products to Amazon. Well, what happened is a ton of guys just started gaming the system, right? They would open a vendor express account to get access to AMS, Amazon marketing services. And, uh, and then they would never ship product in or in the Chinese suppliers would ship product into vendor express and hijack your listing. So now it looks like Amazon's hijacking your listing all kinds of gamesmanship was happening with that program. And the majority of it, in my opinion, uh, started to just manipulate uh, everything they possibly could at, uh, at Amazon. And so Amazon said, you know what, we don't even need this thing, forget about it. Uh, so that everybody was panic stricken when they announced that, that is their access to AMS going to disappear as a, as a result of this change? And uh, happy to say that uh, AMS has not disappeared. There's uh, one piece of functionality that disappeared, but you can still do that in sponsored products. So the, the you know, the fundamental uh, change is the subtle for most sellers, marketplace sellers in particular, you didn't need Vendor Express. You were using it for access to AMS or whatever else. And uh, now that's gone. So uh, it, I, I think we posted, uh, we may not have posted it uh, publicly, but there, there was an Amazon email that said you should have access to AMS uh, ongoing. And at some point, I suspect AMS, the sponsored products, will merge together into one 
uh, user interface and become basically the same program, regardless of who's using it, whether it's a vendor central or a seller central user, I suspect those are going to uh, consolidate and become uh, the same. Um, okay, so uh, one of the other uh, topics is the fact that the cost of storage just continues to rise. Uh, a lot of guys, when they first started selling on Amazon or you know, their first foray into e-commerce was selling on Amazon, and they said, you know, what a great thing to be able to just ship product directly into Amazon. The FBA centers will do all the, the heavy lifting for you. And as long as that product's moving, it, you know, is relatively affordable. And that still is the case today. If the product comes in and it ships out on a short time basis, it's still an effective program. And, the, you know, it's still within the realm of reason, but barely uh, for the, the overall cost. So it depends on the cost of your product. But those, you know, the cost for FBA can range anywhere from, you know, on the low side, if it's a really high dollar item, you know, single digits on up to 40, 50% of your product, the, the cheaper the product is or the heavier it is, what have you. So, you know, you really have to understand if FBA can fit in for you. If it's got a, a viable economic model, great. Uh, but if you leave product there long-term, the long-term storage is gonna kill you. And now that they assess that monthly, you don't even have uh, even, you know, kind of the, the short periods of time of uh, grace period, I, I suppose I would call it where you could slide products in or out based on holiday seasons. They're just gonna assess long-term storage on your product every month after a certain period of time. I think they're assessing it now at six months and it doubles, that assessment doubles in rate at the 12 month mark. So every bit of inventory you have gets kind of a monthly tax on it based on the length of time it's been in there. So what does this mean and why is it happening? Obviously, uh, for those who can't uh, do the math, I'll help you, uh, one plus one, yeah. It means they want more money and they want the product to move. They, Amazon is all about you know, just-in-time delivery. They have no interest in idle inventory taking up space, cubic space in their warehouse. They want that out and, and they're telling you as much. Get it out because we're gonna make you go broke if you keep it in here. We don't care what you do with it. Amazon, you know, as far as they're concerned, it's up to you to figure out the solution. Uh, but they don't want it, idle stuff just uh, gumming up the works in their warehouse. So fair enough. So what do you do? And this, you know, I've been talking about this for the last couple of years. I already thought that the cost for storage and, and uh, so forth was too expensive compared to the main street rates, either of holding the inventory yourself. And if you have a, an organization where you can uh, pick, pack and ship on a regular basis, that's one way to go. The other way and the more common way at this stage is third party logistics centers or 3PLs. So if storage costs are going up, the most obvious way to minimize that is to put the, the bulk of your inventory somewhere else and then you just feed into Amazon as, as uh, the volume requires. So for example, let's say you bring in you know, a container of product and you put that in a third party logistics center uh, and, and let's just say for the sake of discussion, that's six pallets and you sell a pallet a month. We're gonna just do easy math for me. If you sell a pallet a month, you want to feed that in, you know, probably a month ahead of time. You probably want to have at least 30 days of inventory, maybe a little more, especially if you have any seasonality or especially if you have any promotions planned. But your objective should really to be to consider what your move prediction is for the next, let's say, 30 to 45 days and make sure that you have not just enough inventory, but some safety stock as well. The, the last thing you want to have is some, you know, ranking burst or some sales burst and run out of stock. Uh, by the same token, you can't have too much in there and, and hope that you get those ranking boosts because it, it's just simply too expensive. So by leveraging, a, I often call these a cross dock place. Um, and the, the, the premise is again, you land the product from the factory. If your factory is in the US, it doesn't matter, China, anywhere in the world, you land it in a third party logistics center in the United States. And there's two kinds of logistics centers. One is, where they are basically a freight forwarder and they will send pallets for you uh, onwards uh, on, a, on a single pallet kind of bulk basis. So this means you land that container and when you, you send a, a work order, you send them an email, say, hey, send this pallet in, they charge a relatively low amount for storage and uh, you pay the Amazon shipping to get that pallet moved in. I see some cars or uh, some questions coming in, uh, so give me a second. 
So that, that general freight forwarder is a bulk forwarder. Uh, they will hold the inventory for you and then they will ship it by bulk means. Even cartons are probably acceptable to them on some degree, but they want larger shipments to go in and out. That's, that's fine if, if, um, if you don't expect to sell through other channels. If you do expect to sell through other channels, I would highly recommend finding a 3PL that has uh, the ability to do what we call last mile delivery. So they will do pick, pack, and ship, and then they will connect you with a last mile carrier like USPS or whomever. Um, and you can do this through a uh, ship station or whatever. Uh, now, Sean asked a question exactly. Do you have a good 3PL that has a good FBA workflow in place? And uh, he says it's hard to beat the prices he's paying, but they have limitations uh, if they use software. In other words, a port integration option. So this is, this is almost always the case, Sean, is there's almost a correlation between um, technology ability and price. The higher the technology ability, the, lower the, uh, the higher the price, and the lower the technology the ability, the lower the price, ironically. Right? You'd think that technology sh should enable uh, the better price. But some of these guys, especially freight forwarders that deal in bulk, they don't really have a great deal of technology. They bring the container over, they stick it, and they, you say, I got 10 pallet slots, and they keep track of the stock in, in bulk, and then they ship it. Uh, I'm not sure about uh, who's got the best workflows, uh, but I can say that uh, I generally will prefer to use a uh, higher technology, somebody who will at least integrate with ShipStation, and I also use people who can do last mile delivery because I want to sell across multiple channels. Uh, even though if if Amazon's your, your, your bulk of your business and that's where you need to put your attention, that's fine. Uh, but there is a little higher cost on using somebody who can do pick, pack, and ship on an individual basis. So I, I don't want to use real numbers because these numbers change between different carriers and for different reasons. But let's just say for the sake of discussion that you can pay a dollar uh, you know, to a, a big bulk forwarder. They, they cost you a dollar for storage of a pallet. And it's probably a dollar twenty to store that pallet at a 3PL that has uh, the ability to do the the pick, pack, and ship on an individual basis. They can also do the bulk shipments, by the way. Uh, but I would suggest that the pick, pack, and ship is one of the things that can really give you some flexibility to sell on other channels. And uh, when you think of uh, when you think of those other channels, consider, for example, Walmart.com. They do not want you using Amazon. Uh, no other channel wants you to use Amazon, but they are proactively like you're not, it ain't happening. So if you ever really want to sell on Walmart or effectively on other channels, I highly recommend a 3PL that can get the job done. And let's see, Sean adds another note that says, um, they use a 3PL for full automation and bulk forward or feed it uh, FBA, which is a common thing. But the 3PL is too automated and feeding with those SKUs is a nightmare back and forth. That's interesting. The 3PL is too automated and feeding FBA with those SKUs is a nightmare. So I'm, I'm not, I understand that some of these guys have very rigid systems when it comes to uh, bulk feeds and so forth, but I'm not sure what the nature of that problem is. If you want to unmute yourself, Sean, and maybe uh, articulate that a little bit more. Uh, and if you can't, I can. Hey, you can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Go ahead. Uh, tell, tell me a little bit more about what you mean by too automated. Yeah, so basically uh, everything in their system is automated to fulfill all of our Shopify orders. And then what happens is they hold all of the SKU, all of the inventory for a certain set of SKUs. And so whenever I feed Amazon, I have to create manual orders for them to deliver it to Amazon. They have to package everything. Nothing is case packed. Everything is individual packed. And, and say it's, a, it's literally a, a one to two week process back and forth to get all the box content details and enter that into Amazon. Uh -huh. So it's, it's really uh, kind of broken in that sense. Um, they're great for automation. All of the fulfillment and costs and everything are amazing, but the, it's, it's a juggle. And then the other, the other warehouse we use does nothing but uh, feed Amazon. They hold kind of our long-term storage and we pay like eight cents per cubic foot it's pretty, pretty reasonable. Um, but they, they don't do good with, you know, single unit fulfillment or automation. So, so I have kind of 
good solutions for each, but they're, I need one. I'd like to have one if possible. I might still need to stay, stick with the two, but um, you know, con consolidating to one would be ideal. Yeah, so that's a very good, uh, thanks for that extra detail, Sean. Uh, uh, that's, it is a classic problem. And, and to be honest, those are, they're different functions. So first of all, let's talk about the first thing you said, where they're, they're not keeping bulk stock. They, when, when you shipped in your inventory to that, that 3PL who does your uh, Shopify fulfillment, and that, that means they're doing pick, pack, and ships, it sounds like they broke down all of the cartons and put them into individual, um, individual pick, pack locations. Is that your understanding, uh, that they, in fact, took all of the cartons that you shipped in, unpacked them all, and put them into pick slots so they can ship them out individually? Is that about right? I know you muted yourself again. Yeah, that, that's correct. I'm trying to fix that with them now. Uh, basically, the, the product is also a little complicated. That's why this 3PL holds it and the other one doesn't. Otherwise, we'd have the case, the case packed ones at the, uh, the, the one that feeds Amazon. It's got um, currently 40 SKUs and, and some of the velocity is really slow. So some of the orders are only, you know, 20 units when a case is 84 units. So, um, so that's, that's part of the problem. Um, I'm working on trying to standardize that, that way that when the inventory is received by them, it stays case packed as much as, as it can. Um, but, but yeah, it's, it's been a little bit of a challenge that that product's actually going to go from 40 SKUs to, to 120 soon. So we're, we're trying to find ways not to completely uh, make it more of a nightmare. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So this uh, is a common awesomer problem, to be honest, is, when, when you first are dealing with these different types of warehouses, well, actually, when you're first dealing with your manufacturer, you're like, hey, make me this stuff and ship it to me. And we don't give a great deal of thought about how these uh, cases are packed. Um, in, in most sophisticated supply chains, you're going to have a pallet, which is a, a number of cases. And by the way, that'll actually even have a barcode and a UCC code. You'll then have a case that has a, a case pack code that's a UPC and a UCC. And uh, that case has a certain number of inner case packs inside of it. Uh, it. It depends on the size of the item. But if one case has multiple, let's say one case has a 80 units, um, you might have an inner case pack that has you know, sets of, of a 10. And so there's eight inner case packs in there, each again with its own barcode. Um, yeah, it sounds like uh, Sean is uh, on that trail right now. So... The one reality is when you talk to your 3PL, you can let them know that it's important to you that you that they keep, um, let's say you have, uh, you said 40 SKUs. If you ship 40 cartons in, they're going to have to break those, each of those SKUs down into pick pack locations. But if you ship, you know, let's say uh, 10 cartons of each color in, they should only have to break down one carton at a time um, for each SKU to be sure that they can pick pack. And, and whether it's a carton or an inner case pack, that's generally the, the philosophy that we approach it with. Um, and, and a lot of times that's just a pure um, conversation that you have with the guys and, and try to explain. Now, I, I will tell you that one thing to look out for, and this applies to everybody, not just Sean, it's a common thing, especially when there's a, a receiving amount per SKU for them to come up with lots of reasons why they need to break down cartons. So if they're you want to kind of look for that as, you know, if they're getting paid to receive individual SKUs. Uh, so we have uh, one example of a, a 3PL. It was $25 to receive a pallet. That pallet had 1,500 units on it. Uh, and they wanted to bring in all those individual SKUs because they get paid per individual SKU that they check in. So we could have paid $25 on one hand or something like $0.40 uh, per unit on the other hand which was like $800 to receive that same pallet, right? So without understanding kind of their, their um, monetization or without fully, uh, my understanding of the monetization, you wanna look for those kind of little clues. Catalyst 88 was developed to help entrepreneurs achieve their short and long-term goals in e-commerce markets by utilizing the power of shared entrepreneurial wisdom. Entrepreneurship is nothing if not lessons to be learned. Learn from others. Learn from us. I guarantee that we will learn from you. Visit Catalyst88.com because your success is our success. A giddy up. So sometimes 3PLs make money on that, that initial receiving breakdown. And if that's the case, you want to try to minimize that breakdown. Uh, other times, just for um, clarity, uh, like we were shipping stuff out of a 3PL, 
And the same type of thing applied. When we tried to ship out individual units, they wanted, you know, whatever it was, a, a buck a unit and, and a buck 50 unit. I, I don't know what the going rate was at the time. And they, you know, it descended when we increased, but we had something like 450 units we were shipping out. And the cost came up to, uh, I don't even remember, it's close to 500 US dollars. It, this happened actually in the UK. And we're like, this is nuts, you know, to ship out this, this bulk shipment. We shouldn't have to pay $500. And you know they we went around in circles, around in circles, and finally we figured out that the the items were already marked. They all had UPC codes, and we were shipping them to Amazon. Uh, we were running short at Amazon, and there's a bunch of different SKUs. At this time, you didn't have to individually uh, break down what was in the cases, and we we just said, you know what, we'll pay um, a work order. We'll pay you by the hour to just put all these SKUs into three boxes, and we ended up paying like uh, sixty dollars and they shipped this stuff out. So almost 10 times less because we had to really dive into the, how they're charging for things. And that's one of the big, you know, we're, we're complaining about Amazon storage fees, but it's really important that you understand how 3PLs are charging and you know, what is the most effective method of working with them. Uh, to, to reinforce Sean's points, the big bulk feeders um, will you know, do freight forwarding and they'll do really cheap storage uh, but they often will not do the individual pick, pack, and ship. So that's where you generally will use a different solution. Unless your stuff moves relatively fast, then you can consolidate it all at that, that, uh, that other carrier and just kind of keep, keep the stuff moving, feed Amazon as you need to. But I highly recommend keeping as much of it palletized and cartonized until it needs to be broken down. That's best practices anyway. Um, and I, I know that uh, there are uh, lots of different ways of doing things, but this is you know something that has served us well. So, uh, any other questions about three PLs? Let's see. I thought I saw a question from Ed. Uh, Ed asks, uh, what kind of steps should a seller take to assure their inventory is secure and properly accounted for uh, while you while inside AMZ storage? So, Ed, I'm going to take this to to mean when the product is inside of Amazon. Um, your, your question is, you know, how do they make sure it's all, all okay? And the reality is, <clears throat> excuse me, in, in, in the Amazon fulfillment centers, FBA centers, the inventory is always being tracked in Seller Central. So you have a clear um, a line of custody, I suppose. So you can see what's being received, you can see what's being shipped, and you can see what's on hand. And of course, uh, you will get damaged items. You'll get various types of issues that happen at FBA centers. And if you guys, uh, if sellers out there are not following the best practices to get refunds back from Amazon, uh, you're really leaving some money on the table. So uh, I know there's a lot of urban legends about, well, if you ask for too many refunds from Amazon, they're going to cut off your account. But that's, in my opinion, absolutely not true. Amazon has, a, the FBA uh, centers, for example, have a, a, a guaranteed service level with you. Uh, the same with Amazon, uh, the third-party merchant uh, program, whatever they call it, Amazon services. Uh, the point is both of them have obligations to you as a seller that are contractual, which includes if you lose my inventory, you have to pay me back for that inventory. It includes if a customer returns a product and you give the customer money back from my account and the customer never returns it, you have to give me my money back. Now, Amazon themselves admits only 80% of the time are they catching those types of things, uh, those types of things that happen on a common basis, right? They, even when they damage something in the warehouse, or you know, I, I talked about the missing example earlier, but if they damage something, they're supposed to notify you this is no longer fulfillable, and we're paying you for that based on your retail price minus Amazon fees. And that's th those things are supposed to happen. And so there's about nine or 10 different uh, case types that happen and these sorts of things happen routinely and the larger seller you are you're probably having them accrue hundreds if not thousands of dollars a month in uh, lost products uh, you know refunds given and not returned and again people got a little squirrely because they were using automated services and Amazon's like no you can't use an automated service uh, to to file all these claims now I don't know how good those automated services were. I've never used an automated one. I always use a, an agency that will do it uh, manually. 
But the reality is if, <clears throat> excuse me, if you're using an automated service and Amazon doesn't like it, you got a problem. Now, you know, from a purely legal basis, I would tell Amazon that they're, you know, it doesn't matter if it's automated or not automated. If it's a legitimate case, they better pay it. And I, I, at some point, I said, we'll assume that somebody's going to uh, go to the, the legal mat on that as well. So as you think about the, the idea of, you know, filing for these types of claims or these, uh, you know, problems that you may have in an FBA center or refunds uh, given but not uh, actually returned, these are things that I highly recommend you being proactive. Don't do it automated, but there's lots of tools out there that help you establish what these cases are and submit these cases and just have one of your teammates uh, do this, you know, process once a week, just stay on top of it. And it's, it, it, you know, at that point, once you get caught up, it'll be a small amount of money, but it's real live money. And we've used uh, kind of auditing systems like this for a long time. Um, if you do a lot of next day air freight, UPS, FedEx, uh, DHL, whomever, then you're getting shipments that are showing up late and you have every right to get those refunded back to you when they show up later, they're outside of their terms of service. And there are actually auditing companies that all they do is they run around and find you money. And many of them will just give you a cut of the action. Uh, in the freight guy's case, it, it ranges between 15 to 50% that they try to take depending on your volume. And uh, in the case of Amazon services, I think they range also, you know, probably from, from probably around 8% to 25% or 30%, something like that. And I think the reality is something's better than nothing. If you end up getting money back every month as, a, as just a case of um, Amazon messing up stuff, but you don't have to pay somebody on a fixed fee basis to do it, or if, even if you are doing it, you're just using tools to make it a small and easy process, uh, that's just good management. And you should be um, aware of those types of things and, and uh, not miss out on the opportunity to hold Amazon accountable. E even though people will tell you uh, and again, I, I hear so many urban legends around the Amazon community. They will say, oh, Amazon doesn't like it when you ask for your money back or this or that. But fundamentally, Amazon as a company doesn't care. They, they, you know, if they mess up, they want to be held accountable. They have no problem with it. Uh, they don't like abuses. They don't like, um, again, I think automation could be argued as long as the automation is legitimate. Now, I'll give you an example of automation that they hate. Um, and, and this will uh, lead to problems for people, I think. So as many of uh, Amazon sellers know, there are lots of different kinds of competitor mischief that, uh, that occur. And one of the types that has uh, raised its head is uh, turning, you know, basically turning in people for copyright violations. And there are automated services out there that will send out 10,000, you know, 100,000 copyright violation cases a month and Amazon is hating those services because copyright violations give them some kind of legal uh, uh, responsibility. So for those who are not familiar with the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, DMCA, this essentially says, hey, once I notify you somebody's stealing my stuff as a host, as a search engine, as a, as a, uh, a, you know, a technology provider, whatever the case may be, if I notify you this is happening and you don't do anything about it, now you're going to take some of the liability on. And so, you know, Amazon is worried about that liability or potential liability, but they have to balance it with the fact that there's literally companies out there sending in hundreds of thousands of copyright complaints a month. Many of them are completely bogus. For example, if you are a wholesaler and you're buying products and you happen to sell, you know, Disney items, you can't go send a copyright claim on a competitor who's got the buy box because he sells Disney stuff. That's, that's not how it works. Copyright is supposed to be used for the right reason. So in that context, I understand Amazon's sensitivity to automation you know, kind of, you know, being a big problem. Uh, however, from the, from the refund basis, I think automation is perfectly acceptable as long as the cases are all legitimate and as long as they haven't already been filed uh, and, and the automation creates some sort of, uh, you know, duplication. So fair is fair. As long as it's really truly owed, it should be paid. And I don't have any problem with uh, Amazon and Amazon doesn't have any problem with it, but I don't have any expectation that Amazon will try to somehow beat that down because they're giving back what they're supposed to give back. 
Okay. Uh, if anybody else has questions, we're going to be uh, coming to a close here uh, in the relatively near future. So uh, I saw Theo joined in. Uh, looked like uh, maybe Zara uh, popped in, and uh, I see uh, some others in here. So the you know uh, most of the people. Uh, let's see. Okay. So uh, okay, Pinkowski is uh, sharing a little bit of news. This is very good. Uh, so 2015, it sounds like was the first prime day, and then 2016 increased 60 percent over 2015, which is uh, it was already a substantial day. In 2017, 60 percent again over 2016. Uh, they did stretch it out. Michael points out they lengthened it by 30 hours um, to include more countries. Uh, oh, and included more countries. Yeah, that's a very good point. So this is one uh, important note. I'm glad you brought this up, uh, Michael Pinkowski. The the fact is that you know Prime Day actually starts like 18 hours ahead of time, or maybe it's 12 hours ahead of time, and, and maybe uh, goes on a little bit uh, longer. But the point is they're trying to make it into a real event, and they're even doing this with lightning sales, you know, preceding and, and post events. Uh, and again, they're, they're rolling it out uh, on their global platform. So a lot of opportunity. You know, can you imagine if, if they grew again 60% this year? Uh, that's pretty insane. So uh, a lot of opportunity. Um, as I look through my list here, uh, now's the time, again, if anybody has any questions, they can hop them, uh, throw them in the hopper. Um, somebody asked me earlier online, they said they couldn't join, but they're like, hey, can I use uh, Amazon to fulfill for my Shopify site? Uh, the answer is you can do that. Uh, there are pretty simple tools to do it. Uh, when you do use Amazon to fulfill for your Shopify, that's called a multi-channel fulfillment by Amazon. And the cost for that uh, can be, it depends on the price of your product, can be as much as twice as twice the cost of a, an FBA. And so you want to kind of keep, keep your eye on the, the cost when you think about that cost of shipping from Amazon for an external customer like Shopify or any other channel that you choose to use. The good news with the Shopify is there's actually an app that you can use that will make it completely automated. Uh, it's basically It'll connect your inventory to Shopify. It'll show your available inventory. And every time an order is placed, it'll go automatically place the order at Amazon using the multi-channel fulfillment function. When it's fulfilled, it will come back with a tracking number to the Shopify system and automatically uh, fulfill that as well. So the upside of that is it's automated. Uh, one little uh, safety tip for you is Amazon, if you just put in regular shipping on a multi-channel fulfillment, Let's just say you're shipping to Dallas and their stock in Dallas. If you put that in to, as a multi-channel order and you've just put in regular shipping, which has basically a seven day delivery window, they may not ship that until the sixth day and still be within their service level agreement and deliver on the seventh day. What they're trying to do is they're trying to get you to upgrade to a faster shipping. And, and this is one of those things that you have to consider when you upgrade to faster shipping, then they make more money, right? And so if you don't know that, then your, your Shopify audience can be kind of ticked off. Uh, and so you actually can set it automated up to select the faster shipping two day or what have you. So that's a, that's a gotcha that um, I'm glad the question came in. Uh, and I'm sorry they couldn't join the call, but uh, hopefully they'll catch this recording. So yes, you can sh uh, have Shopify do it automated. Make sure you check the, sh the shipping time frame because Amazon will take their time uh, to try to encourage you to pay more for shipping. Uh, I saw a couple other guys join in here. If you guys have questions uh, about selling on Amazon, uh, you can use the chat window. And so the chat is, uh, if you just kind of mouse over the, the main video screen, it's kind of near the bottom. I don't know if it's uh, near where I was pointing, but I uh, pointed anyway. For those on the podcast, you can't see where I pointed, but you'll have to take my word for it. It was right there. Um, all right, one final note, uh, or a couple of final notes. Uh, I see Theo's got a question. I'll come back to you, Theo. Um, a lot of people still asking questions about sales taxes, and there's so much involved with sales taxes. And I would just say the Supreme Court decision, which will have a big impact on the, the existing uh, precedent known as uh, Quill versus North Dakota, 1992. Uh, they did revisit this case earlier this year, uh, and they, you know, they're due at some point, really any day now, to deliver a uh, decision regarding that review of the case. 
I don't know what they're going to do. It's, it's too difficult to uh, forecast. When, when you read all of the arguments from the day, you know, they grilled both sides pretty heavily. And fundamentally, I think the question comes down to, does the Supreme Court believe that there are automated services to deal with the taxes? Uh, the, the state argued, South Dakota in this case, argued that, hey, for, for as low as 10 bucks a month, they can have their, their uh, taxes uh, taken care of. So this is not an obstacle for anybody. Anybody claiming that collecting sales tax is onerous is, uh, is misleading the court. Of course, they were absolutely misleading the court. You know, they didn't talk about the 10,000 different, you know, individual uh, tax jurisdictions. I think it may be up to 12,000 now across the United States. They didn't talk about the fact that once you register for sales taxes, now you're responsible for income taxes in each of those states for the income generated in that state. They didn't talk about the fact that, you know, inventory kept in a certain location could now be required to pay uh, inventory tax or asset taxes that are applicable in some counties and cities and states. There's a whole series of things they didn't talk about. So I don't know what's going to happen. But I think at that point, once they make a decision, that's when we can look a little further into policy about uh, how to deal with uh, sales taxes. Uh, the best news is, um, I think it is... Um, it's Washington for sure, but it might also be Pennsylvania that have said basically marketplaces are responsible to collect sales taxes. So if you sell on Amazon, Amazon's got to collect tax in Washington and submit it to the state of Washington. That's how everybody should do it. And I believe Shopify has been forced into doing that, eBay and all the rest of the, the so-called marketplaces. So that's, that's a positive thing. I hope the, the court looks at those things for direction. And just one final little asterisk, even when the court decides they're not specifically deciding whether or not FBA inventory in a particular state means nexus. Uh, in other words, whether or not you have nexus with a state and are responsible to uh, that state for uh, various taxes. Uh, but it should be directional and it should give us some, some uh, idea. So before I come back to Theo, I see Marky has asked a question. He says, is FBA, Amazon FBA still a viable business model in the under $50 category? So I think it's a fair question. I do get this question pretty often. And the answer is yes, it's definitely still viable. Um, I wouldn't go too far below 50. I think under 20 is, uh, is a problem and you really have to be able to deal in volume to make under $20 work. But I think 25 to 50 is still quite viable. Uh, and it, it all comes back to the products you pick, how you do your product launch and your marketing and so forth to get visibility. Uh, as everyone should know if they don't already, just putting a product on Amazon is not enough. That's like, you know, looking at a star in the sky and then trying to count the rest of the stars. There's billions of them. Uh, you're not going to get found unless you're on page one of the organic search results, which is uh, based on the A9 algorithm on Amazon. So when, for your main search terms, if you can't find yourself on page one, then you're, you're not doing enough for visibility. And there's lots of ways to kind of increase that visibility uh, so that's an important thing to consider. So yes, uh, as a matter of fact, Marky, I would go farther and say, not only is it still viable, I still consider it the, one of the best. So e-commerce as a category is the best business model that I have ever experienced. And I love it. And I think within, um, e-commerce starting on FBA gives you the most leverage, which means the highest potential return on investment with the lowest potential upfront risks of any business uh, out there still to this day. And as a matter of fact, I think it's getting better, not worse. Uh, too many people, especially those with uh, maybe, uh, I'll just say they don't have the same experience that others have. Uh, they, they are like, oh, the salad days are gone. You know, three years it was uh, easy and now it's hard and impossible and blah, blah, blah. And I've been selling online for 20 years. I, I, my first sale was in 1998. And every year somebody's pronouncing it's the end of the internet, it's the end of this, it's the end of that. And I've seen it all and it's, it's just the beginning. We are, um, I think Winston Churchill had a good whole, uh, quote, I'm going to try to butcher it here for you guys, but it's something like, you know, this is not the, the end, uh, this is not the beginning, but this might be the end of the beginning, right? So the last 20 years was the beginning of e-commerce and we might be at the end of the beginning, but it's still at the very freshest part of this nascent industry. So it's a really great place to be. I love e-commerce and there's absolutely decades of upside ahead. 
Uh, Theo asks me, um, how much clarity do I have on importing into Canada? And I've done Canada for a number of years, so some clarity. <coughs> Excuse me. The government custom site is super confusing. Uh, all right, well, that's, uh, I think a lot of governments share that. And he needs to get a business license, et cetera. And how do you file income? So one of the things I would recommend, Theo, or anybody who's looking to, to go into Canada, is that you can get the importer uh, numbers and things like that through a, uh, typically a broker who's uh, brokering your freight. So when your, your freight can actually be inbound, and then when you clear the customs on that freight, they can help you get the, the required numbers for, imp, for importing uh, relatively quickly. So I, I, you know, I would ask them for help. And say, you know, if you're really gonna go into Canada and you're gonna do it right, then you should probably just find an accountancy firm that can handle Canada and have them help you get set up and get it done right uh, so that you can you know, not have surprises later. You know, my, one of my uh, least favorite things in business is surprises. Uh, you know, everybody likes to, Hey, surprise. Well, forget that. And in business surprises, I mean, you didn't plan right. You didn't prepare well. And I highly recommend never having governmental surprises. They're the worst. And with the cross border trade increasing every day, all of these governments are trying to figure out how to get their hooks into it. So if you really think Canada is important enough to you, then just go do it right. Um, and there are plenty of lawyers and accounts that can help you get that stuff set up. Uh, as a side note, and I'm going to come down, I see uh, Sean's got another question. Uh, for everybody who hasn't heard about this, but uh, Australia has just passed basically a law that says, hey, uh, if you uh, are selling into Australia, guys like Amazon specifically, marketplaces, you're going to be responsible to collect the GST, which is their uh, sales tax. And Amazon just launched in Australia, and their response basically is they're going to block Amazon.com will not be accessible to Australians. Uh, they're, they're doing a geo uh, block, which means if anybody tries to go to the regular Amazon.com site, which has many, many more products than the Australian site, they just simply are blocked and redirected to the Australian site. That's how serious Amazon is. And I actually think that could have a, you know, uh, depending on your product, but it could have a 1% to 2% impact to your sales. Probably not something that you're going to notice automatically, but Australia orders a lot of stuff. I don't know how many people look at their, their geography, but you know, probably uh, in many cases, Australia could be already 1% of your sales. So you might have a little bit of a, a hiccup there if you're not already in Australia. And Australia is developing quickly, uh, and there, there's ways to get into these other countries uh, using uh, Amazon's business development department. Hey Amazon Marketplace Professionals, this is Parsimony ERP, and we get one question over and over. Can you please tell me exactly what Parsimony does? Well, we'll try, but this is only a 30 second spot, so we're going to have to hurry. Connect to your Seller Central account and pull all the new orders. Enter the orders with all customer data. Enter all of the Amazon fees and charges. Store them at the item level. Generate profit and loss reports at the SKU level. Automatically generate income statements. Handle multiple companies. Handle multiple brands. Handle multiple currencies. Facilitate budgets and forecasts. Store all customer interactions in a sophisticated CRM system. Manage your supply chain. Project and task management. Maintain an audit log. Hey, you get it. That's parsimony, P-A-R-S-I-M-O-N-Y.com. Parsimony.com. We've got that. So Sean asks a pretty good question. He says, do you believe using any groups for ranking boosts is fingerprinted or has a digital footprint? Um, I've heard that, that using launch services can be risky because of this. So let me just reframe the question for everybody's benefit. So there are services out there that offer kind of uh, giveaways. Um, Snag Shout's an example. Uh, you can uh, post your product on there and then in, you can discount it to whatever level you want. You can give them a dollar off, you can give them you know, $100 off, uh, uh, or we'll just say the percentage, you can give them 1% off or you can give them 99 or 100% off. And the, the principle is if you do these types of giveaways, then this will help boost your organic ranking. So there's a few things in there. And by the way, there's a, there's a number of these types of services that are out in the marketplace today. And uh, there's a lot of speculation. Again, the rumor mill is running like crazy, but very few times do I see them matched up with facts. So the rumor mill says 
they don't work anymore. Um, you know, Amazon's ignoring them, this and that. And I can say that there is a, an evolution that's happening at Amazon from what I've seen on a factual basis. For example, it used to be that these launch services, let's say you did 100 review or 100 giveaways that were literally free price giveaways. Uh, the, any reviews you got were verified reviews because they made a purchase. Well, now Amazon looks at the discount level and decides if that's a verified review or unverified review. The prevailing wisdom, by the way, is that anything more than a 40% discount will be an unverified review, if the review even sticks at all. And so there, you know, that's, that's an indicator that Amazon knows what's up with these uh, types of services. I have no doubt, uh, in fact, from an empirical data standpoint, absolutely Amazon can can do digital footprints on these types of customers, these giveaway customers that have a high propensity to buy discounted products from a variety of vendors. And it's very clear who these people are from a data perspective, I'm sure of that. Uh, whether, whether or not they're looking at it or whether or not they're taking action on it, I don't know. It doesn't appear that they are because these booths still work, uh, these customers are still able to buy. And honestly, what's the downside for Amazon? If the review manipulation piece is out of the equation, um, you know, one could argue that over time the, the ranking boost could, could disappear or go away, but that hasn't happened yet. Um, and there's also a, a general customer experience benefit to Amazon customers to be able to get low price or free stuff. It, it drives the ecosystem. If this same type of ecosystem existed at walmart.com, Walmart.com would be getting more sales. So Amazon has to balance this, you know, the, the positives and the negatives of this. If they just simply said nobody can do anything at any time, that ecosystem will just move over to Walmart or somewhere else. And that's probably going to happen at some point anyway. So uh, one thing that, that uh, and I could tell you, uh, for those uh, listening, Empowery has a very, um, I think, very unique approach to this uh, problem in terms of uh, the Empowery uh, uh, co-op and how they deal with it and doing um, basically uh, rebates and, and general brand marketing that is all well within terms of service, yet it, it helps accomplish the goal of increasing awareness. And you know, often you'll get ranking boosts as a, as a side effect of those types of things. So those are the types of things that we still think work uh, we know they work, by the way. Um, I just did a, uh, a few months ago, a relaunch of a product. Uh, the name, main keyword had fallen back to 260 because we ran out of stock for a long time and uh, we were too lazy to get it back in. And within eight days and 125 uh, giveaways, we were, uh, or rebates we should call them, we were at position number three. So it's, it can be very, very effective. And, and honestly, a game changer still. So is there a risk? Yes. Um, but if you mix between different launch services, there's probably less risky to you. And if, if it's just part of your overall uh, launch program, then it's probably also okay because over time you're gonna get regular organic sales. You're gonna have promotion sales from sponsored products, maybe some external traffic from Facebook or, or others. And all of that, that, I think what Amazon wants to see is, is a big gumbo, right? The more ingredients in there, the more honest you probably are. Whereas if you just have a bunch of free giveaway sales, like so many guys, um, you know, one of the things that, uh, one of the black hat tactics that is being used uh, in China, for example, is they will contact um, Chinese uh, university students and they, they will pay those students First of all, they give them the pri uh, product price, right? So whatever the product costs, they, they make sure they have that money. And then they pay them 5 to $10 to go buy the product and leave a review. Totally black hat, completely against the uh, Amazon terms of service, but they'll launch a product and have 500 reviews on the first day. And this is exactly how they do that. So these types of black hat techniques, you know, they're, they're not ideal. And again, from a data standpoint, it's absolute that Amazon can tell, you know, what's up. That, you know, that, that those types of things are not going to work forever. And that's probably a, a very good point to kind of uh, wrap up this theme. You know, when we think about, you know, driving a business and being in e-commerce, 
all of us want the easy button, right? We, we want that silver bullet. We want just what's that one button I can, I can click and just have passive income and, and sleep uh, and nap for the rest of my life and take it easy and cruise around the world, whatever it is. The reality is it's, you know, entrepreneurs are problem solvers. Our responsibility is to find a problem and solve it for the customer. And then all the problems that go along with solving that problem, they're kind of side effect problems. That's, that's what we solve. And, you know, for years, uh, Michael and I have uh, worked together on and off for 20 years. Michael now uh, is heading up the parsimony.com uh, SaaS model, which is a, a full service ERP. But we, we used to just say, if it was easy, anybody could do it. And it's not super easy. Therefore, that's why, you know, awesomers out there have the opportunity to make a difference and earn, you know, their freedom lifestyle or whatever they're trying to get. So it, it really is uh, a fine place to be in business and, and I, I wouldn't trade it for the world. So uh, in the absence of final questions, I'll give you guys just a, a minute or two uh, to answer any final questions. Uh, Sean, yeah, absolutely appreciate you. Good to see you online. Safe travels out there. And uh, uh, for those who haven't uh, already, you can go, uh, there's a, a free photo giveaway. Um, and I, it's somewhere posted in the uh, online in the Facebook groups. But uh, there's a, a King Sumo free photo giveaway if you want to have your new product with nine high resolution, fully edited images. You absolutely can uh, enter the free giveaway. And uh, we'll put it in the, the show notes as well. But these uh, types of giveaways are really fun. Uh, it's the, the only requirement is the product has to be in China. But it is a, a, a nice little free giveaway for everybody. So anybody who's launching a product in the next you know, 45 to 60 days, you got the chance to get free photos done in China before your product that even arrives in America. The photos are typically done. They're beautiful. They're high res, white background, all Amazon specs. And again, uh, free is hard to beat. Actually, I'm paying for the, uh, the amount. So uh, it's not free to me, but it's free to you. Um, and uh, finally, uh, everybody, thanks for uh, joining us. Uh, you can go to awesomers.com. The podcast um, is available. Uh, by the time you hear this on the recording, it'll be available. But for those uh, who are attending live before we launch, it's going to go live uh, later on this summer, uh, hopefully in, uh, sometime in July, but if not August, uh, we got to get a lot of episodes done. Thanks, everybody, for joining. And uh, if you do have questions, uh, uh, you can find us at awesomers.com, ask questions there, or back in the Facebook groups as well. Uh, thanks again, everybody, and we'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye. Okay, uh, episode number five is a wrap, everybody. And we hope everybody got something out of that live Q&A session where real, real uh, awesomers from around the world joined us and asked their questions. And you'll have that opportunity to, to join us in a future episode. Just follow along uh, the awesomers.com uh, website, the blog, and keep your eye on various Facebook posting where we'll post live Mentor Monday or other similar sessions that may be upcoming. Hey, and don't forget to share this with a friend. It really is a best way to pay it forward and, and help somebody else out that you know who's on the path to being an awesomer, whether an entrepreneur, a writer, just somebody who's breaking out of the normal paradigms of everyday living. We certainly want to uh, have them enjoy our journey as well. Thank you very much. Well, we've done it again, everybody. We have another episode of the Awesomers Podcast ready for the world. Thank you for joining us, and we hope that you've enjoyed our program today. Now is a good time to take a moment to subscribe, like, and share this podcast. Heck, you can even leave a, a review if you wanted. Awesomers around you will appreciate your help. It's only with your participation and sharing that we'll be able to achieve our goals. Our success is literally in your hands. Thank you again for joining us. We are at your service. Find out more about me, Steve Simonson, our guests, team, and all the other Awesomers involved at awesomers.com. Thank you again. Awesomers.